that uh, you know Giles was able to, point, uh, to sort of collaborate with my late father and work out this uh, book, which I hope some of you will have had a chance to read, because it is actually excellently written, um, much better written than you know, what we made our first draft with uh, struggling over. Um, I certainly like to just a couple of minutes answering that, but I just wanted to react to something that uh, uh, Yasmin spoke so eloquently, and you know, and I, I agree with her fundamental point because the, the, the panel which we're on today is this cultural contribution of Ugandan nations in the UK, right? Um, just to react to that, I, I agree with her fundamental thesis that it is a shame that as a community we don't seem to have contributed as much openly to the arts. Uh, as other communities, and particularly we always compare ourselves to the very successful Jewish community. Um, I think the Jewish people have sort of had an experience of diaspora going back centuries, really much longer, with much more of a sort of written structure about than what we inherited, you know. Uh, our inheritance didn't include uh, a feeling of diaspora, except when we were brought up in East Africa, we were told that well, originally we come from this little village in the middle of Gujarat or Punjab or somewhere. And that was it, and then we visited, and then visit our relatives there, and then this was home, East Africa. So we're limited to that. We don't have that sort of tradition. Um, it will happen. I, I have full confidence that I think what you do. I mean, you're probably aware, I mean, our, our art scene, our cultural scene in, in metropolitan cities in India are so vibrant, you know, and uh, they're full of the mixed cultures that they have in the city, like Bombay, but so many different cultures. So here we are bringing our own culture, whether it's Sikhs, Hindus, Muslims, integrating, not integrating with the uh, Western society, European society, as it itself is evolving. So I have every confidence that it will happen. And as we contribute more, businesses will come forward and say, yeah, this is also our obligation, apart from just supporting the mosque and the temple. Yeah. I mean, there, there is a wonderful word in Sanskrit called shama, or they do have that means. It, it actually means a number of things. It, the main translation is tolerance. But it also means appropriate, it means fit, it means sort of doing the sort of properly the right thing, and working things out properly. I think all of this takes time. I think our story is still too too young, you know, and I, I have every confidence that with people like you, young people, I might say, you know, pushing over festivals like this, which we would like to encourage, I'm sure it will happen in due course. Uh, my family, just to say a couple of words, I really can't put it any more eloquently than what Giles and my dad uh, wrote in his book, and uh, I, I, I really do hope some of you have a chance to, to read it. Uh, in essence, yes, what, what Giles summarized very correct. Um, my family was one of those families that didn't come on the railways, like a lot of people here, families come and that. Uh, we heard the stories uh, of people who were doing very well in East Africa. In our case, there was a phenomenal uh, businessman who preceded us, who maybe would have heard about. Uh, Aladina Vissa, uh, who was very well known throughout uh, all of Africa, actually, Central Africa. And um, everybody sort of looked upon him as a sort of example. And uh, my father's family was no exception. We came over, we started uh, trading first, and then we sort of diversified into uh, tinning, uh, into other estates, tobacco growing, and so forth. We tried our hands in lots and lots of other things until my uh, grandfather hit upon sugar, which he struggled with and almost went bankrupt at least two, three times, uh, but then finally succeeded. Um, and then since then, um, he died in 58. Uh, my late uncle, Giant, uh, very much someone like you mentioned, Sugar in this one, who was a member of one of the members of the Legislative Council in Uganda at the time he was uh, very pro-independence. Um, he felt that Uganda should sort to work out his whole identity, he insisted that all of us become uh, Ugandan citizens, which we retain until 1972. Um, and he was very much an idealist. Um, and of course, my late father, uh, both of them, they worked together, and of course, they developed the business into lots of other things. Um, of course, uh, in 72, we had um, this gentleman called Idi Ami. And um, I think it's, it's very easy for, for, for us. I, uh, you know, of course, as a community, we are to blame for all of these. I don't think there's any community in the world. Uh, you know, uh, and we have to admit it. The Germans have admitted it. The British have admitted it. All types of things that they might have done once more. And of course, we have to admit it. But I think someone like uh, Amin was quite a unique phenomenon. You know, uh, someone who, who really did, uh, uh, if 
take to courses, you know, not only everybody buys appropriations, but even more so his own countrymen, you know. I mean, they find it quite difficult to forgive him, let alone us, you know. Can, can I ask, I mean, you know, it's popularly known that Ilyavi had a dream, and Jesus came to him in the dream, they said, wouldn't Jesus say anyway? Divine. I mean, okay, that's that's there. It's documented. It's told. It's, people laugh about it. But what were some of the real reasons? I mean, that's the. Yes, he was always was underestimated. I mean, has been. He uh, was underestimated initially by the British, very much so. Um, and uh, Charles has read the story about that in the time and tell you about it. And his father-in-law had warned him about uh, the, the, his, his grandfather-in-law grandfather had told him about you know how dangerous this man was. But generally, he loved playing the buffoon. He really did. And beyond, behind that buffoonery, he was a, a, a very calculated person. Um, I remember he used to come quite often at uh, home in Kakira for sort of drinks and so forth. And you could have a conversation I was about 10 years old with him. This big guy, head of the army, very impressive, you know. And um, you, you could, you know, almost fall for his buffoonery. And he did that very successfully with Western journalists. His strategy was, I think, um, political. His power base was being threatened. Since he took power, Obote was always trying to get back. Uh, he had brought the Tanzanians behind him. And he wanted something, uh, some sort of um, rally, maybe some of his own people. Uh, by that time, he had lost the support of a lot of the Ugandans anyway. But he wanted to make sure that his own crowd supported him. And I think the Asians were a good uh, sort of uh, target. And I think that was his strategy. So he was, it was a strategy. It may have been a dream, but it was a strategic dream. Did he not, <laughs> did he not fear the world, what, what the rest of the world no, was? I saying? don't think so. Um, basically, because uh, that's the way he was. And that's why people, particularly the Brits, underestimated him. Because when they brought him and groomed him and thought, oh yeah, he's the guy that would take over more water. You've got to go back to the Cold War mentality. You know, it's either you're with us or you're not with us. So they were worried about so voting you know, and going after Nereri and the Chinese and the Russians. I mean, we'd just be totally pro-Western. And that was their, what they didn't cater for was that they put either West or, 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 or with the Russians, but they did cater for his own little thing uh, of what he was about to do and what plans he 